Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a weekly show featuring interviews with fantastic authors sharing their personal stories on how and why they write. There's hints and tips for aspiring writers and great book reviews from top bloggers. Follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast. Right, cue the cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing. Grab yourself a drink. It's joined up writing. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 84 with American author Tosca Lee, who writes historical fiction and supernatural thrillers, sometimes blending the two. I loved hearing about her road to publication and her love of writing, and I think you'll really enjoy the interview. There'll also be another trip to Book Bloggers Corner with another insightful review from Catherine Sunderland. Before we get cracking, a little update from me. It's been a productive week for the show, with me heading down to London to record three rare in-person interviews in one day, talking to Emma Viskich, Melanie McGrath, and the HarperCollins editor, Cleo Cornish. They were all fascinating chats, and you'll be hearing those in the coming weeks and months. And my chat with Cleo in particular really focused my mind as to why it's so important to think of your book as a commercial product, particularly in the later stages of of your edit, when you need to be shaping the book and really wringing out every drop of story that you can. Stephen King talks about writing your first draft with the door closed, Um, something today's guest Tosca Lee touches on with her version being right like no one is watching but then thinking about the wider audience as you redraft and finesse the novel opening the door is how King describes it and so that's been at the forefront of my mind and just this morning I woke up early with another extra twist to add to the later part of my book I just felt like there was another way that I could raise the stakes even further for my main character and I've had a lot of fun writing that new scene this morning so that's what I've been up to but what about you what are you uh, working on with your current project have you got any tips you want to share with me or the other listeners well you can do that by tweeting us at ju podcast or drop me a line at wayne at waynekellywrites.com okay enough about me let's get to the main event and my chat with tosca lee Tosca Lee is an award-winning New York Times best-selling author of several historical fiction and supernatural thrillers, as I mentioned at the top, including Iscariot, The Legend of Sheba, Demon, a memoir, Havar, The Story of Eve, and the Books of Immortal series with New York Times bestseller Ted Decker. And Tosca's new thriller, The Progeny, is out now. Okay, Tosca, thanks a million for joining us on Joined Up Writing. Really appreciate it. Um, how's things? Oh, it's been busy. I'm, um, I'm technically behind my deadline, so I've been writing like a mad woman. And when, when that happens, it's just writing and then sleep and then eat and then go back to writing. So <laughs> that's been my life for the last three weeks. So. <laughs> so so you're probably bleary-eyed. It's a good job this is audio only, so you're probably bleary-eyed and feeling it's, a bit tired. Yes. Yes, I have not showered, and it's very <laughs> good this is audio only. <laughs> Well, why don't we start off by um, you telling us a, a little bit about your latest book, which I think is Firstborn, and I think that completes the duology. Is that right? So tell us a little bit about that series. That is right. So Firstborn is the sequel to The Progeny. And The Progeny is a, a story about a young woman named Audra Ellison. And she has elected at the beginning of the book to go through a procedure and erase the last two years of her memory. And then she starts life over again. And when she starts life over, she, of course, you know, does not know now why she chose to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, as she starts over in, in Maine, which is in um, the northern part of the U.S., and she's living in the woods and she's got this quiet existence um, that's very mundane until it's shattered one day um, by a man coming to say um, that there are people out to kill her. 
And so she ends up going on the run. Uh, she ends up going to Europe. And this is kind of a globe trotting book. Mm-hmm. And um, she learns that she is the descendant of infamous real historical serial killer Elizabeth Bathroy. And that the descendants of Elizabeth Bathroy, like her, have been hunted now for centuries. And so she learns a little bit about who she is. And then she comes to realize as well that she's protecting a very valuable secret, um, a secret so valuable that she had to take it out of her mind. Because when these people who are hunting, um, these descendants kill them, they gain all their memories, which includes uh, memories of other people like them. Excellent. So, so it's like protection. She's protecting herself. She, she's protecting it and other people and the secret that um, is... Uh, very volatile. And so that book ends on a cliffhanger and Firstborn picks up exactly where it left off and continues that adventure and uh, wraps it up. Excellent. So Mm -hmm. obviously, so you kind of mentioned there, so tell us a little bit about the the genre. So it's kind of, it's got elements of historical fiction, but obviously you've kind Mm -hmm. of weaved in your, your, you know, this other, this other kind of plot. So, you know, what do you love specifically about this, this genre and are there other authors or books that inspired you? Yeah, you know, um, it leans very, it leans young adult, um, and I like the feel of that. So I've been inspired by a lot of the great young adult fiction coming out these days. Um, I do love historical. I've I've been known in the past for my historical novels, um, and I did this this whole series. This duology started when a fan asked me to write a story about Elizabeth Bathroy, actually, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the Blood Countess, and you know, which makes her very intriguing mm-hmm. automatically. Um, and I I found her absolutely fascinating, but I wanted to do something contemporary. So this was a way to mix those genres and have thriller with historical elements, a little slight paranormal. Um, Yeah. And to just create this kind of run for your life, um, you know, high tension story. Like a kind Um, almost like a kind of chase story. It it is. There's a lot of that. And the second book is, is really nonstop, which was really fun for me because it's, you know, I think it's a great challenge as a writer to, to see how much, you know, tension you can throw in. There's all different kinds of tension that can go into a story, you know, everything from running for your life to relationships, um, and how late I can keep my readers up at night, basically. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what about historical fiction in general? So you said you kind of started out in, in historical fiction. What drew you mm-hmm. to that? Was, was that something that you had a background in or? You know, I, no, I, I didn't, but I've always, I've always enjoyed reading, um, stories about interesting people from the past. And I used to be a huge, uh, King Arthur, fanatic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I came over um, to the UK, that was, you know, (laughs) as a teenager, I had to go to all the King Arthur places. (laughs) So, yeah. yeah. Um, So I've always loved that. I've always loved uh, biblical fiction characters um, from the Middle East. I've Mm -hmm. always, I mean, it's just all kinds. And, And I think the interesting thing is, looking at what outstanding and and fascinating lives that they led, but also learning that, you know, they really weren't that different from us. We're really all the same. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And the the important, I think the important part of history, the word history that people often forget is story, isn't it? I mean, these are just, just like a collection of stories, really. It's stories. Yeah. And you know, how much of that story is really true, Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's kind of interesting to surmise about that so oh, yeah because it's you know it always well often depends on who has written it in the first place doesn't it we, exactly yeah and, and we do that with people in our lives too i mean you we tell stories about people that we know right here and now and mm-hmm. and how many of those stories are truly accurate about who that person is absolutely you know? depending on your yeah. perspective yeah sure so yeah. so when you approach especially if something's kind of rooted in a specific historical time or uh, uh, surrounds real events how do you approach the research for each mm-hmm. time period and are you kind of I guess it depends on the genre that you're writing in but are you willing to be kind of flexible with certain historical details for the sake of the story or do you like mm-hmm. everything to be absolutely accurate no matter what I'm kind of a stickler for accuracy um just because I I know that there will be readers who are interested in 
that particular historical time period or or character who will have already read or done some research. And so I don't want to ruin the suspension of their disbelief by having a blaring error if I can if I can avoid it. Um, so I really try to get as much right as possible. Um, I go to all the places that I write about, um, except for when I, I wrote about the Queen of Sheba and going to Yemen was not available <laughs> or, you know, or advisable. You had to that Google time. that. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, mm, you know, and given that that's a 3,000 years ago type thing, I figured I could fudge a little bit there. But um, I did go all over Europe for um, the progeny books, and I took my mom with me. We love to travel together, so... Um, you know, and I think there's no substitute for actually going and being there, you know. Absolutely. So, and how much yeah. of that, how much of those, do you, do you have a tendency in your first draft, do you have a tendency to sort of throw everything in, you know, all mm. this information that you're fascinated by? Do you find that you have to cut it back? Or do you, how do you find the right level of, of detail that mm -hmm. you put in and how much of that research that you use? Yeah, you know, that's something I've learned how to temper through experience, because in my early books, there was always way too much, and I'd have to call it back, you know, mm -hmm. because you need enough to support the story and to be interesting. But you don't want to overwhelm the reader, because if they were reading purely just to learn about those things, they'd be reading nonfiction. Sure. So, so I've learned, you know, what the right amount is, it's just something you kind of um, learn as you go. Um, so I, I don't find that I'm putting too much in usually. Um, yeah. Just something and, and, you've learned with experience. Yeah. You kind of just learn it with experience and you pick and choose the details that are going to be most helpful to the reader and most helpful to the story. Sure. Well, why, why don't we go back a little bit? So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you actually came to writing and when you, when mm. did you know you wanted to write your first novel? Well, um, I never really thought of writing as a thing. I, I wanted to be a professional ballerina, and it's something I pursued very heavily. And um, But I, I was always a writer, and I used to win contests and stuff. And and then I, I was coming back from uh, – I was, I was back home on spring break. I went to school in Massachusetts, and I was having a conversation with my dad about – one of my favorite books of all time called The Mists of Avalon. It was a King Arthur book. Mm -hmm. And talking about how a great story is like a roller coaster, a roller coaster ride. You know, it's got yeah. loops and twists. And, you know, even if it's an emotional roller coaster as opposed to, you know, a run for your life type thing. And I just blurted out that I would like to try to write a book and see if I could do something like that for another reader. And my dad said, well, I'll make you a deal. Um, I was supposed to spend the summer. I was actually going that summer to study at Oxford for a little bit. But mm -hmm. then I was going to spend the rest of the summer working as a bank teller, which I was terrible at. <laughs> and he said, I'll make you a deal. You spend the rest of your summer uh, writing a novel and I'll pay you what you would have made working at the bank. Wow, that's amazing. And yeah, I thought, you know. That's so cool. And I, of course, said yes, because I really didn't want to work at the bank. <laughs> it was an easy decision. So, yeah. Um, so I went off to um, Oxford for a little bit. And um, while I was there, I bought books and books and books and books because I really, really, really wanted to write this um, novel about the Neolithic um, people of Salisbury Plain, mm -hmm. the Stonehenge people. Sure. So I'm fascinated with your country, apparently. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you located, Wayne? I'm in the Midlands. I'm in Leicester, so I'm right. I'm very landlocked in the middle. So okay. we're we're famous for um, Richard the Third. Is it? Oh that's yeah. Richard the Third was found under a car park. That's right. Oh yes, I read that. So that's article. my hometown. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I'm landlocked too, but I'm in Nebraska, and we're famous for football and beef. So <laughs> <laughs> nothing quite as American football, I should say. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I came home and um, I wrote my first novel about the the kind of original Stonehenge people. And it was, um, I wrote it very quickly. I had no idea what I was trying to undertake. I would never try to do a historical novel of that scope in a summer now. Uh, <laughs> sure, <yeah. laughs> it was stupid, but you know, I did it. And then the next summer um, during break, I sent it off to a um, 
agency, um, a writer's agency to mm -hmm. see if I could get an agent. And I waited and waited. And I finally got this letter back that said, um, even after reading the 23 page synopsis, <laughs> Never write a 23 page synopsis. I mean, <laughs> I found advice. this letter the other day. Yeah, <laughs> never do that. I found the letter the other day and I was, I cringed. It was, I was so embarrassed for myself back then. But um, they said, even after reading the synopsis, that they were still not sure what the book was about. The characters were two dimensional, it lacked tension, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, in other words, it was sure, not good. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but the last thing they said was, it was. Uh, reminiscent, however, of Clan of the Cave Bearer, which was another one of my favorite books of all time. And so all I took out of this whole experience was my book was like Clan of the Cave Bearer. <laughs> and I was like, I got to do this again. And so I kind of fell in love with this and um, kept writing. And I eventually wrote um, a, most of a fantasy novel that never quite got finished. And it, part of why it didn't get finished is because I got the idea to write the story of a fallen angel. And I wrote it very quickly in six weeks and got it done and thought, okay, this must be meant to be. Uh, no, it took six years to get that story published, but it was my first published novel. Sure, so yeah. that was about uh, 12 or 13 novels ago or so, something like that. So, But you basically dived in and you learned from doing it. Yeah. And, you know, you, there, there's no other way to learn how to write a novel, mm -hmm. you know, other than going in and making all the mistakes and kind of getting dirty in there and mucking around, you know. So um, and then looking back and figuring out what worked and what didn't and how to fix it. Yeah, absolutely. In a, in a, in a way, you're kind of lucky that you got the feedback that you got mm -hmm. from that first novel, because, I mean, a lot of people they, they don't even get that feedback you know they send it That's off true. and they would never ever hear anything again and they wouldn't know anything about it so the fact that they as you say they gave you some detailed some kind of detailed oh, yeah. feedback and uh, obviously you're a positive thinker because as you say you took the one <laughs> thing that you took out of it because again that you know a, a more a, a more delicate or pessimistic person might have you know crumbled <laughs> under, yeah. under that and just thought well I've had a go but I'm not going to try it again so that's it's yeah, kind um, of it's the perseverance things kind of paid off. Yeah, I think if you want to do this, particularly if you want to do it for a living, you have to a be very tenacious, and b you have to have a philosophy about rejection. And I I, I never tell people you have to have a thick skin because that's very hard to do. And if you're not thick skinned to begin with, most people don't change, mm -hmm. you know, so it's still going to sting. It's still going to be hard. But when you have a philosophy about rejection, then, you know, that helps you process it in a different way. As far as, is this constructive? What can I take away from this? How do I continue my journey? Um, and I, I found too, you know, in this career, uh, sometimes when people leave reviews and things like that, um, some of them are constructive or some of them are just a matter of taste or opinion. But every now and then you get a really vitriolic review that's just mean. Of course. Yeah. And yeah, just like uncalled for mean. Mm -hmm. And um, like, you know, that person, you feel like they want to come over and kick your dog or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the only way you can deal with stuff like that is to realize that, you know, when people treat you that way, and this is for writing as well as life, that they're telling you more about themselves than they are about your work. Completely, so, yeah. Well, and you can't, as an author, you can't write to every reader. No. You're writing to your sliver of your audience, your ideal, your tribe of people. Absolutely, so, yeah. Yeah. So what, what yeah. It, in particular with writing, what, what is it for you that you love? What do you love about the, about the actual process of it? Mm, you know, um, I have to say first drafts are very hard for me and I do know writers that love first drafts. Mm -hmm. Um, that would probably not be one of my favorite things though. <laughs> like being on deadline right now, of course I'm laying down a first draft <laughs> yeah. being towards the end of that part. I really enjoy the end mm -hmm. part, the beginning of a first draft though. No, mm -mm. Probably my favorite, though, is uh, I'm a very obsessive person and I like to pick at things. So I like the editing yeah. and I like um, I like when I have something already to work with that I can then make even better. 
That's interesting because this is the second interview I've done this week and uh, both of you have said the same thing as regards that. Really? You don't oh. like first drafts and it is unusual because most people mm-hmm. like, you know, the first, the thrill of the first draft because, you know, there are they no do. boundaries yeah. and just off you go. I mean, I, I really like the beginning of the first draft. Uh, you do? I, I don't, yeah, I love the beginning of the first draft because there's literally... Depending on how you write as well, I think is the other thing. I think if you if you go out to if you want somebody that has already planned everything out, then maybe it, it might be different. But for me, when you first start and you've got this exciting kind of kernel of an idea, and you think, right, I'm just going to run with it and see where it goes, then it tends to be a lull in the middle, and then mm. maybe if I've got, if I'm if I've headed off in the right direction, maybe I'll kind of get a little bit more excited about it as I'm coming to the end. Yeah. Um, I don't to having said that I don't hate editing but it does require it's kind of a different part of the brain I find and it is really it can be really really thought intensive the edit and the rewrite yeah when you're trying to it, it get stuck not you know bits of the plot to match together and then thinking about things about characterization and thinking well actually if I made the right decision with that person and would they do that and now they've done that with you know and it's thinking about other permutations and I think that can be quite exhausting and it's not as for me it's not as fun as just the raw kind of creation of like just coming up with something but but as you say everybody likes a different part of the process but it is interesting because you are the second person I've spoken to in a couple mm-hmm. of days that said, that said that so that's that's interesting that makes me feel better because most of my friends enjoy the first draft yeah. and um and the editing part is very exhausting mm-hmm. and because it's very analytical yeah um but that that is another reason why when people when you know writers starting out ask me for advice my advice is often don't edit as you go Absolutely. because you have to switch back so much mm-hmm. you know back and forth and it's better to just stay on that creative side i think it's the right side of your brain the creative side and you know not not put yourself through the ringer of having to try to skip back and forth between those two hemispheres of your brain yeah, completely. So you, 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 uh, the way that you approach it is to just get the whole draft out and then tackle mm-hmm. it afterwards. Absolutely. That said, you know, I, because I do like picking, the temptation is always there. Um, <laughs> you know, and I have to stop myself if I find myself trying to go back. And because what happens is you'll get mired. And yeah. when when people begin books and don't finish them. And I learned this from the book that I started and wrote for nine years and never finished Mm -hmm. is that what's happening is they're going back and trying to fix and fix and fix Mm -hmm. instead of just finishing. So my advice is always get the the story finished, get the book finished, then you can go back and do all that. Absolutely. And I, and I, I was the same when I first started writing longer things i think the other thing with it is is often you'll edit you could be editing something that doesn't even end up in the final draft right you know you so, could go yeah, over so you find yourself doing time. yeah you find yourself doing you know quite specific kind of line edits and things on it and worrying about that sentence and that paragraph or whatever it is and then right. when you've actually finished you actually oh well, actually i don't even need this scene anymore so that was a right. complete waste of time it was and when you when you do this over and over if you plan to write more than one book you know part of the learning that you do is how to be more efficient with your writing and so that's another reason not to go do that cuz like you said it may get cut yeah absolutely so you so you mentioned obviously so as is often the case when I speak to people on here is your 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 first novel is in the first novel that actually went out into the world and was published is often not is not the person's first novel that they wrote and it sounds like that was the case with you but so right. so what was your kind of road to publication that first novel how mm-hmm. did that eventually get published can you tell us a little bit about that sure um i tried to submit it um several places wasn't getting much of a response. I, so I did get an agent and we continued to submit it and we would get some rejections. And, you know, like you said, you don't always get personalized rejections. Sometimes you just don't hear, sometimes you, you get a form letter or whatever. Um, but when we were getting the feedback, it was that they wanted the story to be in a slightly different format. And I was trying to figure out how to do that. Um, 
And I was systematically just getting rejected everywhere. And finally, um, I was at the spa and Mm -hmm. there was, I ran into a lady there I knew who is a published author and she knew that I was trying to do this. And she said, how's the writing coming? And I just went meh (laughs) like that. And a few weeks later, she sent me a newsletter and it was a physical paper newsletter back when they still did those. (laughs) Yeah. And she she had circled something. And she, it was about an imprint that had a a publisher that had a new imprint coming out um, that my book might be very good for. It was a kind of a paranormal, um, supernatural type, um, actually more of a spec, speculative fiction sure. uh, imprint. So we tried it, and the editor said, "I love this book." Um, but then he left that imprint. Oh. So I was like, ah. Uh, he ended up going to a different imprint that had already previously rejected me right. and acquiring the book there and and also giving me the kind of advice on how to restructure it. And so I rewrote the whole book um, and they took it to committee. When, you, when you're publishing, they have to take it to the, an internal committee mm-hmm. of the editors and the salespeople and everybody so they can weigh in on, you know, what basically whether they think they can make money on this book. Sure. And uh, they came back and they said, okay, uh, what else do you have? And I had written um, just a little one page scribble about uh, a very old ancient Eve as an Adam and Eve getting mm-hmm. ready to tell her story before she dies. And I was like, well, I've got this. And they're like, great, we'll take that and one more. And I was like, I don't have one more. And they said, you'll think of something. So um, so I sold my first book in a three-book deal. And um, yeah, it was really cool. Um, it was a very long time coming. It was like famine and feast for, for a yeah. while. Yeah. I mean, there's no such thing as an overnight success, you know. No. Um, my first book did well. It won awards and stuff. But it took, you know, decades, literally, to get to that point. So, well, we are, yeah. We, we often talk about um, waiting for your ship to come in. But sometimes I think yeah. you, you have to be ready to row out to meet it. And I think, yes, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, you, you the, the fact that you'd been through all of that and you'd been the whole time you kept going with your writing and you kept learning new stuff and you kept, trying to you know write other books when the opportunity came along and they asked you that question what else have you got you know yeah. I know you only had like a you know a half scribbled down idea or whatever but <laughs> you did have something that you you know you got in your mind that was kind yeah. of ready to go and a lot of people you know they'll do that where they kind of submit things and they'll immediately start work on the next thing anyway because they think well I'm going to write something else and if I do get picked up then at least I'll be in a position to say I've also got this um, right and I would definitely advise anybody listening who wants to pursue publication, you know, while you're waiting to make that first sale, keep keep writing. Because that I wish that I had had, you know, finished that project. Because what happens is you sell your first book and if it does, you know, starts to do well or whatever, and you're trying to write your next one in the midst of marketing that and all that commotion going on, it can really kind of mess with your mind a little bit. So just go ahead and write the next one and write the next one and, and have those, you know, on your shelf waiting to go. Yeah. And I think anybody that's actually doing it for the right reasons, because let's be honest, it's in most instances, you're not really going to become rich and famous um, no. unless you happen to be you know Stephen King <laughs> or JK Rowling or somebody mm-hmm. um, so you should be doing it because you love doing it anyway and you like the creative part of it so you know whether you get published or not you know presumably you're gonna you, you're gonna keep, keep doing writing it. stories and you're gonna keep keep doing it yeah so yeah keep writing and so if so if you were sitting I mean obviously at the minute you're deep into a first draft and racing against a deadline but imagine <laughs> imagine that you were starting a brand new novel tomorrow how would you approach it have you kind of kind of got a consistent way of doing it you know what's mm-hmm. your kind of your, your your process um well I've tried a couple you know different ways you know in in my career and I've done the the outline method before and I've also gone into novels before without much of an outline um so that's the plotters versus the pantsers the seat of the pant yeah Yeah. um and I I have friends who do both for me I find that I'm kind of a hybrid 
I really do need to have some kind of an outline. Otherwise, I, I will end up having to rewrite more. So that's what happened on my book that's coming out in January. I did not have enough of an outline. And so to get the novel where I needed it to be and where it, it, it should be, it, it required more work. So um, I, I do a, a fairly... Um, it's a loose outline, but I, I get as much detail in there as I can. And then um, then I go in and start writing and adjust as necessary. And at the beginning, I, I also do, um, I brainstorm with um, friends and with my husband. And I've got kind of a very like small group of trusted brainstorming friends. That's good. Um, yeah, and I think that's really helpful. Um, but all that said... I, I do think that when you've got your outline and you go in and you start writing, however detailed that outline is, um, stuff happens in the writing process that you, you can't plan for. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's good. And that's the cool part of writing, you know, those little fun things that the twists that come along. And that's, what's been really fun for me. Um, this last couple of weeks, I've been having a lot of fun with that part because you know, I've got the bare bones, but the way it's it's turning out on paper has been really, really cool. So, when yeah. The, when those things just <laughs> pop up and surprise you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or things kind of fit together better. Or, you know, you've got these, like, kind of strings that were kind of out there, and then they kind of tie up in in ways that maybe you didn't see coming. And, and when you approach it... Um... Well, this is something that we don't, I don't normally actually ask this, but I've had a number of people like sort of ask me and say, oh, I wonder what they kind of use. Do you use, uh, in terms of software for writing, do you use just Microsoft Word or do you use Scrivener or anything else? What What's your kind mm -hmm. of, or do you not care? Um, I've, I use Scrivener for um, books that require a lot of research mm -hmm. because it's a really, um, it's a really easy way to keep, your research organized. Mm -hmm. And before that I used to do it just with folders and tons of documents and it was just a mess. So I like it for that. I have not really learned how to write in Scrivener. <laughs> that's, um, a familiar, that's a familiar <laughs> tale. That's lots of people say that. The learning curve is so steep and I'm a terrible learner, I guess. I just, or I'm impatient or I, I procrastinate so long that I don't have time to learn it before I need to get started. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, so actually, I write in Word. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I actually, I mean, I'm a big Scrivener convert, but I, I was like you. I mean, I, I had it for ages. I like, I, I got it like on the offer that you had when you completed Nano. Uh, NaNoWriMo you know years and years oh. and years ago um, yeah. and I was all excited about it I'd seen the thing about the cork board and you know all these different things you can do and then I remember opening it up and thinking right okay how do I use this <laughs> and being like really deflated and then not really touching it for probably I don't know two years or something um, but then I saw like one little it was literally a 10 minute video and it, everything on just YouTube clicked. Or something, yeah, or? it was. A, well, it was actually. I think it was actually on Joanna Penn's um, site. I think it was the thing. I don't know whether you know Joanna Penn. She's like runs the Creative Pen website, and she's got a big mm. podcast. Um, but yeah, and it was. It wasn't that it was like particularly. It it was just literally kind of her saying, "Well, this is kind of how I've got my project set up." And when I saw that, it kind of clicked. And it's um, not that I'm any kind of expert, but. Um, the actual, once you get the very basic part of it, which you could literally learn in a few minutes, you'll probably just kind of run with it. Because the thing that I don't, I think if I went back to Word now, I think the thing that I would struggle with is the, um, in terms of like chapters and scenes or however you happen to write. Mm -hmm. When I come to the editing part, the great thing about Scrivener is I can literally just grab a chapter or a scene, depending on how you've broken your novel down, how you like to write. I mean, I write in chapters. Um, mm -hmm. I can just grab a chapter and just pull it to somewhere else in the novel, but um, yeah, it re in the rewriting and the editing stage, it is so useful. It is Real, it okay. Really useful. I need to just put the time in. Right, let's take a quick break there for this week's book bloggers corner, and this week Catherine Sunderland reviews *The Storykeeper* by Anna Mazzola. This is the BBC, 
Book Bloggers Corner. In the Story Keeper, Mazzola uses folk tales, the myths and legends of an island's history, the art of storytelling and the rituals that bring people together to create a fascinating and intriguing story. From the very opening, the atmosphere is deliciously mysterious with a palpable sense of foreboding which is completely captivating. The main protagonist, Audrey, is an exceptionally well-crafted character, seemingly brave and bold but harbouring pain and a darker past. She arrives on the island with the hope of assisting with Mrs Buchanan and her quest to round up the oral history of the people on the island through the stories they tell. I love Mazzola's writing, her prose is beautiful. She tells a tale which, although very firmly set in the past, feels as alive, vivid and accessible as any contemporary novel. Just as with her first book, The Unseeing, Mazzola strikes a perfect balance of capturing the ambience and feel of a novel written in 1850, as well as creating something that will resonate with the reader as much as any contemporary novel. The dialogue is particularly effective, true to the time, place and characters, always authentic and convincing, but always readable and without pretense. I was caught up in the varying threads of the storyline, captivated by the people on the Isle of Skye, on the edge of my seat as the mystery of the murdered and missing girls unfolds and the tension and suspense increases with expert execution. There are many themes explored about belief, consequences, the importance of stories and the secrets harboured by families. I am now decided that Mazzola is definitely one of my favourite writers. The story keeper seems to absorb the strongest elements of Hitchcock, Du Maurier, Charlotte Bronte and S.K. Tremaine to create a novel that entertains, fascinates and draws the reader in an unputdownable historical thriller full of mystery, unsettling imagery and a gripping plot. It's a five-star read and a contender for one of my books of the year. Book Blogger Corner there you go, The Storykeeper by Anna Mazzola, reviewed by show regular Catherine Sunderland, a.k.a. Bibliomaniac, and you should check out Catherine's other reviews and posts at bibliomaniacuk.co.uk. Right, let's get back to my chat now with Tosca Lee, where we talked a little about the lessons Tosca's learned along the way. If you were to go back to the start of your career again, or that first novel, what would you do differently, do you think? What what? What have you kind of learned from that? What would be your main main thing that you've learned from that journey? Um, a couple things. One is is what I mentioned before about you know keeping writing while you're waiting for that first contract to happen. Uh, it just makes it easier on yourself. Um, yeah. The yeah, and the other thing is, I think when you're at the front of your career, so before you've published your first book, you're at a very um, brave and adventurous place. And I think if I could go back, I would want to experience and remember what that feels like, because that's a really special kind of protected time in your career. You're not out there on Amazon yet. You're not getting reviewed. You're not getting critiqued. You're not, you know, so you're not worried about those things. And, you know, one of the pieces of advice that I give other writers is to to write like no one will ever read it, mm-hmm. which kind of goes against common, you know, wisdom since you are writing for somebody to read it, obviously. Mm-hmm. But it keeps the, the writing bold and audacious and, and authentic. And you can go back and take stuff out later if you have to, mm-hmm. but it allows you to be um, courageous in your writing. And I... I think if I could go back and just kind of um, remember and recapture that, you know, early part, which is what I try to do with, you know, that rule of writing, like no one will ever read it. Um, but for, for people who are feeling discouraged or feel like, um, you know, this hasn't happened for me yet, just, you know, take this time to continue to write and, um, and be bold. So Absolutely. Well, yeah. on that subject of moving forward, as we kind of work towards the end of uh, just wrapping things up, so tell us what what's coming up next for you. Well, right now I'm doing um, the sequel to a book that's coming out in January. So the book in January is called The Line Between, mm-hmm. and it's about a uh, young woman who has just uh, been kicked out of a 
apocalyptic doomsday cult on the American prairie, um, just in time for a pandemic to hit and for it to seem like the end of the world that she was always taught was coming. Mm -hmm. So um, here she is dealing with the fact that she doesn't really know how to function in this, you know, out in this outside world and in this society and trying to survive um, this pandemic. So it's been kind of a fun adventure. Um, that comes out January 29th. And um, the book I'm doing now is the continuation of that. And so where can people find out more about you and your work online? Um, my website, so that is toscalee.com. So it's just T O S C A L E E.com. Um, of course, Amazon, and I'm on social media. I'm on all the usual places <laughs> and um, pictures of writing life and also farm life. I'm married to a farmer um, <laughs> on Instagram. So you can go there and you can see my new dog. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah. Brilliant. So I'm everywhere. <laughs> I'm everywhere. Well, I'll make sure I put all those links in the show. But for the time being, I know you're going to stick around for the um, the epilogue. But for the time being, Tosca, thanks so much for coming on. It's been great to chat. Thank you so much for having me. This has just been such a pleasure. Okay, thanks again to Tosca, and you can find her books on Amazon and all good book stockists, as well as more information on her website. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That wraps things up for another week, but don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. Make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and that way you can have the show downloaded automatically every single week. Also remember to get in touch with all your writing news, views, questions, comments, or anything else you want to get in touch about, and you can tweet me with where you're listening or why you enjoy the show, and I'll give you a mention in an upcoming show. Until then... Thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing and reading, and I'll see you next time. Joined up writing.